Hello, everyone, and welcome to the accessibility talk. I'm very happy to see such great interest uh, on this topic. Um, I'm here with uh, Benedict. Benedict and I, we are part of the Web UI team at OwnCloud. And um, we will give a short overview on our journey to accessibility at OwnCloud. Um, first of all, um, I will talk about what, what is accessibility and um, why do we need it actually, um, some problems we encountered and what we learned from it. So accessibility, um, I guess you know it all from the real world, um, is actually the design of our environment um, as so to be usable by people with disabilities. So if you look at this picture with the tram, there's a ramp. Um, which enables people with, for example, wheelchairs to enter the tram. And in the web, there are, of course, also those kind of barriers. For example, if the um, font size is too small, then people who can't, um, who, who don't have good vision might not be able to read it. So this is considered to be a digital barrier and needs to be made accessible. And this is just an example. And what we made at OnCloud is that we um, added kind of accessibility to the new web UI. So on the left, you see the classic UI. On, on the right, you see the new web UI. And there you can see, for example, that um, everything is um, really good visible. And there are also good contrasts, for example. I won't go too much into detail here. Um, so why do we deal now with accessibility at OwnCloud? And the answer is very simple, because we need to. Um, there had been some, um, some um, directives by the EU. Um, the, the first one is the directive 2016-2102, which actually means that every public sector um, body needs to be accessible. Um, regarding the um, digital services. Um, and as of 2025, there will be the European Accessibility Act will be enacted. And this will mean that the private sector services um, also need to be accessible. For example, banks, passenger transport, and so forth. For banks, for example, it will, um, it will mean that um, ATMs, for example, need to be accessible. Um, and so, as we always also have customers from the um, from the public sector, we of course also want to be um, accessible. So it actually needs to be done accessibility, but um, we encountered very different attitudes towards the topic of accessibility when it comes to the implementation of accessibility. So on the one hand. Um, we encountered people who said, hell yeah, that's a cool idea. Let's make the world a better place. Um, but on the other hand, there are also voices that, that say, oh no, that's really much effort So for so, such a small group of people. Um, this is very common if you go into online um, communities and, and um, chat rooms. This is always those two parties there. So... The problem is that the push for accessibility really starts with you, meaning in, you, in your mind, kind of. Um, so this means if you are not really convinced of making things accessible, the whole project is kind of doomed to fail because it's a really long-term project. And the question we had was, why do people have such different attitudes towards accessibility? And Arguments I often heard about um, against um, impl implementing accessibility are mainly those th um, three, um, but there are a ton of, uh, ton of more arguments against it. For example, it's not economic because it's high effort for um, a very few people. Um, or another one is that um, it makes the UI design really ugly. Uh, and the third one is also often heard, heard is um, that it's, uh, there's just no motivation for it because maybe it's just imposed by law. So, um, yeah. And I, I thought of similar situations um, that required extra efforts in the past. For example, um, about 2010, um, there was the rise of mobile websites. So that means that you suddenly had to uh, implement a second kind of front end 
which meant an extra effort, which you can see on the right. It's a mobile website. And other examples are the, um, that HTTPS got forced as a standard, for example, by the GDPR, so to speak, or the Google search or, or the browsers. This was in 2018. I think since then, there are almost no sites without HTTPS and actually all kinds of software updates. They all mean uh, extra efforts, but um, there, I, I encounter much less mental pushback against the topics above than against implementing accessibility. And we ask, why is that so? And maybe the answer is kind of in this image on the right. Um, my assumption is that the, com the, the common mental image of disability refers to a personal health condition. Um, this is somehow depicted in this icon on the right. And this leads to um, an attitude this, which is like, um, this is not me. So you don't get a personal connection with accessibility unless you, you encounter a, a, um, a disability on your own body, for instance. So this is something I, I really disagree with. So I would opt for a new definition of dif disability in the terms of accessibility. So I would say, Disability is not a personal health condition, but it's, it strongly depends on your contextual situation. So what do I mean by that? Look at all those people, and they are all somehow affected. So they, they all encounter digital barriers. And it strongly depends on their context at the moment when they use digital media. For example, if you think of a new parent, um, then you are very likely to be, for instance, very, very tired um, or that you need to um, control your laptop with only one hand because you have your baby in the other hand. So this perfectly fits to accessibility requirements, to be honest. And this is just an example how your context um, makes you um, kind of disabled. And the takeaway I, 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 want to, I want to give here is that um, for an accessibility quick start, um, first of all, think of access, um, if you think of accessibility, don't think of this pictogram. Don't, don't think of this wheelchair in the first place. Um, because digital barriers often arise from your contextual situation. For example, if you have a kid on your, on, on, on your, on your arm, or if, you, if you're in a car or if there's strong sunbeams on your display and you can't read it because there's low contrast. So it all very strongly depends on, you, on your context. And then how you get started is, what's our best way is to check your accessibility to-do list and start with the barriers that personally affect you in the first place because there you get a personal relationship to the issue. Um, and this is actually a really good um, way to get started with accessibility, in, in our opinion. Um, then if you, if you are more familiar with the topic, then you can start with the harder accessibility, accessibility issues later. And Benedict, he collected some really good examples, um, actually four, um, which are good for starting because they could affect everyone. And now Benedict will do a little deep dive with you into those technical issues. Benedict, yes. your turn. Toby, thanks for the nice introduction um, and, and the general overview for the topic. So um, I hope that I took over the screen share successfully. <laughs> um, and, and Toby, that you unshared your screen so that it works. Um, now I have some more slides uh, for you and, and uh, I would like to give you an overview or a proposal of how to do, um, how, to, how to get a hands-on approach with um, you know, starting to deal with web accessibility. Like we would do it if we would start all over again. So um, to do that, I would first like to, to uh, get you a little bit onboarded in, in how, to, how we started at the beginning of this year to deal with accessibility and on-cloud web. 
Um, so our goal at the beginning of the year was to comply with the WCAG 2.1 AA level, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is a huge set of uh, rules that have to be fulfilled in, in order to be accessibility compliant. And in Germany, there is a similar thing that is the BITV 2.0. Um, our, our goal was to get compliant with that and even get a little bit further than that and get a certification for it. Um, that is not needed in any case. And um, what I will tell you in the next few slides will, will not be about the certification, but just getting better and getting familiar with accessibility. So what we did was... Um, uh, one, one second, Benedict. I think mm -hmm. your screen is not shared. Okay. try to share it again <laughs> yeah oh you know it should work yeah. thank you thanks okay so I think now it gets a little bit easier to follow. <laughs> um, so uh, what we did was uh, we, we uh, got consulting from an accessibility expert regarding our current state of on-cloud web, of the, of, of the accessibility compliance in on-cloud web. Um, and the outcome of that was a, a yeah, huge list of GitHub issues with, with um, accessibility violations that we had at this moment. What we did was go back into engineering, fix a lot of that, and then we contacted an ag agency for um, an accessibility certification, which is in Germany, the BITV 2.0 test. Um, you don't start right away with the, uh, with the certification attempt because there is very little chance that you'll succeed on the first try. <laughs> and um, because of that, we had a hands-on session with that agency and that resulted in a to-do list. We fixed a lot of those issues. Then we had another hands-on session to validate if the current status quo is not better than before. It was, but it was still not good enough. So um, we had another to-do list from this hands-on session. Um, fixed a lot of that again. Uh, thought that we had fixed um, everything except two issues. And then we started the certification attempt. Um, that is not meant to be to be paused, but the agency really does a certification attempt in, in one go. You give them a demo system. Um, they look at uh, and, and what you present to them um, on their own. You have no influence there. And um, then you get a nice report back. In this report, we had uh, we, we had stated that 89% um, of all the different criteria of a huge catalog um, was now accessibility compliant. Unfortunately, for a certification, this is not enough. You need to have 100%. <laughs> um, so we made a list of, of GitHub issues, uh, again, with the remaining accessibility violations. Um, and unfortunately, there were different priorities in the meantime. So the certification attempt number two is still pending. We know that we are in a very good state now regarding accessibility and that we resolved a lot of, of uh, blockers, not only for accessibility, but also for usability. And that is what I want to tell you in the next slides. So um, don't do this, this um, certification in one go attempt. That is really hard because accessibility, accessibility is a really huge topic. Um, what I would like to propose instead is um, yeah, you need, as you heard from Toby, you will need to get uh, give it attention in the near future. And um, it's a good idea to get familiar with it. And the easiest way to get familiar with it is um, to really get hands-on and, and um, try to understand challenges and get them fixed. Um, and of course, it's easiest when you start with the easy challenges. So let's have a look at, at some of our learnings. Um, most of that is basically a comparison of what we had early this year um, in contrast to what we have now. Um, the first one is, is really simple. You might say stupid, but that is, I think, uh, due to the um, yeah, early maturity state of the software. 
uh, at that point. Um, so if you would uh, fire up an, an um, OSIS instance from January this year, uh, which is still possible because we have um, all the, the tech preview releases available on GitHub. So you could just, uh, after this talk, you could just try it out for yourself. Um, and you would open multiple tabs of the same on-cloud instance, OSIS instance in this case, um, in your browser, then you would see um, actually multiple tabs appearing in the same way because page title is the, the first that you see or that you might see um, from your current page. And in this case, I have the uh, all files app with my marketing folder open on the first tab. The second one is my deleted files list. And the last one is my shared with me page. And you have no chance of, of seeing that just from the page titles with the January version of OSIS. Mm. So who is affected by this? This is not only people who need to use a screen reader to interact with your with, with own cloud. Um, instead, this is basically anyone um, who has the audacity of using multiple tabs at the same time. I know a lot of people who have really 40 people, uh, 40 tabs open at the same time. So it might be a good idea to get better there. Um, so what we did was an obvious solution, just make the page titles unique. We decided about a format for our page titles and try to keep it, not, not actually try, but enforce to have it consistent uh, throughout the whole application. And in our case, that is um, the active item, if there is any, followed by, a, uh, for example, the, the marketing folder from the example before, followed by a hyphen, followed by the page name, which is, for example, all files or deleted files, or a media viewer whatsoever. Uh, followed by another hyphen and then the brand name. In by default, this is on cloud um, when, when you start in OSIS, but if you use theming and uh, provide another brand name, that will also be reflected in the page title. So if you would open the same set of tabs um, in a more recent OSIS version, you would see marketing all files on cloud, deleted files on cloud, and files shared with me on cloud, which is a lot better. Little side note on how we did that technically. So luckily we had most of the information available already because in the extension system for OnCloud Web, we enforce um, all applications and pages to have a proper title. And we just used that. That was mainly used for, for um, the H1 tag on any page. And now it's also used for the page title. So anytime so we, we set up a, a watcher for the current route and anytime the route would change, we would set the document title um, to the one extracted from the current route, which is fairly simple. And I think in total, just 30 lines of code, maybe 40. And that's it, huge improvement for yeah, basically anyone. Um, the second example is um, about instructions and forms. Instructions and forms are mostly um, the, the label and the description for placeholder. Um, so what we have here in this example is uh, the sharing dialogue in the right sidebar. So you want to, may want to share your marketing folder with someone and you can type in, can try to type in the username. The form gives you an idea of what, what you could type into that form element. And in this case, I typed in something, something, and then following happens. Um, I get distracted by my, chi my child in the other room and I need to leave the computer for five minutes, come back. And then I have to rethink what I need to do in that form element. So not only people with cognitive disabilities, for example, um, a bad short-term memory or a corrupted short-term memory um, are affected by this, but really anyone who might get distracted in some situation, which is really, again, anyone. Um, another example, which is luckily not from OnCloud Web, but um, which you will find throughout the World Wide Web, is uh, yeah, the, the misusage of the placeholder element in uh, input fields um, for a label. So this becomes an issue, really a usability issue, not only an accessibility issue, when you um, uh, when 
you visit a page which has a form and you have uh, autofill enabled in your browser. And or a similar situation or same situation when you um, go to a page where you want to edit information, which is pre-filled because you want to edit it. And if you use misuse the placeholder um, element of the input for the label of the input, then the following happens. You visit, visit the form, you see uh, a pre-filled value, and then you need to clear the form element to see what is supposed to be in that form element. And then you can happily type that same value again, um, which is yeah, kind of annoying. <laughs> so um, the decision uh, that we made for how to improve that um, is again same screenshot um, or is another a screenshot from a from a more recent version of um, OnCloud Web uh, from the sharing dialog in the right sidebar. You can still see a proper label above the input element that was like that before, but the um, instructions on how to use the form are not. In, as a placeholder inside the form element anymore, but as a description below. And that stays always uh, always visible. So the solution is really to, to have valuable information always visible. And for form elements, this is mostly labels and description messages. Um, so if I have the same situation as before, I can um, invite people, I can get distracted, come back to my machine, and um, with one look at the screen without changing any value, um, I can see what's going on and how I can continue with my, with my workflow. Again, technical detail on, on how to solve this. You can just use what HTML offers natively. So that was actually the most surprising bit um, of or the, the most surprising learning from this accessibility uh, yeah, path that we followed since uh, early this year. Um, that, that HTML, uh, using HTML correctly already solves a lot of things um, that you might not think of before. So um, for this particular situation, just add a unique ID for any form element, which is a good idea anyway, and probably already done by most of the people. Um, place the label before the input in the DOM tree. So um, yeah, and then connect the label um, to the input element. And that is simply done by using the for attribute of the, of the label um, and providing the HTML ID of the input that you uh, created before. Um, for the description, it is possible in a similar manner. There is the aria described by a property, um, which connects the description um, from uh, uh, yeah from this uh, span below the the form element to the input, um, and that works in a similar way. Just uh, setting aria described by on the input and then um, providing the ID of the description element, and you don't need to set aria labels. So if you get in touch with aria properties, um, which is a huge um, yeah, technical aspect of uh, getting the web accessible, um, you might overuse it. It is not necessary all the time. So in this case, um, an, an ARIA label needs to be used if you want to overwrite information that is um, accessible already. Um, so if you want to make it more precise or if there is no information available and you want to provide some accessible information. In this case, the label already does the job perfectly fine because it's connected to the input and it says um, what, what it describes, um, you don't need to set an ARIA label to override anything. Okay, so for the third learning, or just, yeah, as a recap, um, for, for forms, just make labels and description messages um, visible at all times so that you don't have to clear any values to, to see those um, those messages on the screen. Um, okay, so the third one is about accidental destructive interaction. Sounds a bit, a bit weird, so let's um, look at an example again. Um, this is about public links in the right sidebar of our files app again in OnCloud Web. And um, I've created this public link before. It has three elements for interaction. One is the copy to clipboard link. 
uh, a button. Uh, one is the edit button and one is the delete public link button. And if you again would fire up a Gnosis instance from January this year, and you would click on the delete public link button, maybe accidental or on purpose, you would just do this. Okay, I deleted this for you. <laughs> and the public link would be gone. And um, I will tell you in a few seconds why that would actually be bad. Um, so anyone is affected again by this um, in, in yeah, some everyday situations. So you might be traveling in a bus and the bus hits a pothole on the street. You were just um, hovering the button with your mouse and in that very moment you accidentally hit um, the, the mouse button or touchpad and the link is gone. <laughs> so yeah, similar situations with holding a child in one arm and it just goes crazy. Um, and of course, there are accessibility reasons as well. So there are people with motoric disabilities, for example, Parkinson's disease, um, where accidental clicking happens um, yeah, more than you could think of. And for such situations, it is good to introduce um, a usability change. And that is um, to, yeah, to enforce user confirmation for such interactions. And as a bonus, you can also be use that chance to be uh, chatty about the risks of um, confirming that action. So in our case, deleting a public link now spawns a modal on the screen, and it tells you, um, or it asks you the question if you really want to delete this link. And it also says recreating the same link again is not possible. So you might need to think, uh, think twice if you really want to do that, um, because yeah, people might have a previous public link or the one that you want to delete. Um, and if you delete it accidentally, you need to reshare and then send the link out to the same people again, that is just so that they can uh, access the same resource again. Okay, so we solved that with a model and some technical details um, or some good ideas when using models in general. You should think about um, keyboard interaction for the models. So it is a good idea to set up a focus trap for um, for models so that when you hit, hit the uh, tab key on your keyboard multiple times, you will not cycle out of the model with your um, focused uh, with your focus element, but you will stay inside the model. You will just flip back and forth between the cancel and the delete button in this case. Um, and another thing that you want to um, that you want to do is that you set up proper focus management for the for both of the actions. So if you cancel, um, <coughs> sorry, if you cancel deleting uh, the public link, you will want to revert the focus back to the triggering element to the button that um, that um, created the delete action. And if you confirm. Um, you will want to um, forward the focus to the next public link in the list. All, all of that needs to be thought of. Um, yeah, and we've done that in, in our cloud app. Next one is um, has a little bit smaller uh, audience, but is actually my favorite. So what we did um, was thinking about keyboard only usage. Um, for most of the people, interaction happens uh, via mouse or at least um, using interactive elements like buttons or following links. Um, that happens with a mouse for most people. But if you want to get really productive um, with an application, and for OnCloud Web, we, we want that, um, then you need to also support keyboard, uh, keyboard usage of the application. Um, for that, it's a good idea to just be honest and, and try to use your entire application with just the keyboard. That was mind blowing for us <laughs> um, because it was not possible. Um, just give me a moment. Sorry. Um, and this is. Yeah, as I said, this is mostly concerning power users or people who want to have a high productivity environment. But it is also relevant in accessibility manner for, for blind people or people using a screen reader because they cannot use a mouse. 
and um, yeah, some some general advice and technical advice on how to improve your keyword navigation. Um, you will want to use um, the the tab key for cycling the focus through the interactive elements on the page and every element that needs to be reachable for interaction really needs to be reachable. No exception on that. Um, you will want to have a consistent focus style. For us, it is this bluish border. And um, we ensured that with our um, with our design system. So OnCloud Web is using a design system of, of uh, components and design tokens. And um, all of these components have a proper focus style enabled by default. So if you write an extension for OnCloud Web, um, this is something that you don't need to think about because we solved it in the design system. <laughs> um, you will want to um, enable using escape for cancellation, for example, in modal dialogues. Um, and you will want to have enter and space for interaction. So for example, if you um, on, on a checkbox, um, hitting the space bar should toggle between the checked and unchecked state. Or um, if you if you traveled to a button in your page and um, and want to use it, or to a link and want to follow it, then using enter should um, do the same as clicking with the mouse. As a bonus, up and down arrows in list-like elements are always nice, um, just for easier navigation. But that is no, I think that is no hard requirement actually. So the building blocks again. Use, use HTML as it was intended. So anyone who, who was involved in web development in the past might know situations where you actually use something like a span styled like a button um, as a replacement for a button just because of various reasons. Um, and that will cause issues because um, it, it might be that keyword interaction doesn't work, only, only the click handler that you set up worked, works. Um, doing that with a button is really solving this natively um, because keyboard uh, keyboard interaction and mouse interaction will work um, like they are supposed on any button. Um, same as focusing an element is, is not possible by default on this band. You will need to set a tab index on this band to make it focusable and a button is by, by definition focusable. Um, so you make your life easier as a developer when you just uh, use what HTML already has. And um, yeah, if you need to make elements reachable or focusable um, if in, in other situations, you can set up a tab index. Uh, it is always a good idea to set a focus trap. And um, if you want to have additional key bindings, uh, you, can, you can do that certainly. So for example, the up and down arrows are sometimes not uh, natively available, and you need to set them up um, yeah, on purpose. I hope that I have still some time left. Uh, yeah, I do. So um, we, we lied in the title. Um, we have a fifth lesson for you today. Um, and I spared you from that in the, in the slide, slides before, because this one is not so easy to implement. Um, the ones before were fairly easy to implement and, and really a good start for getting familiar with accessibility. The one that I want to show you now is, um, yeah, really important, but a little bit harder to achieve. So there are color contrast ratios and color contrast ratio is defined as the um, ratio of relative luminances of the foreground and the background color. Luminance is the amount of light that gets emitted from um, from a certain element, and um, yeah, calculating that is fairly simple. Um, we just divide the, the foreground and the background luminance, and there is a minimum possible contrast ratio of one to one for it to equal luminance values, and there is a maximum possible ratio of twenty one to one for high contrast um, luminance values like black and white, or the other way around. Um, everything else lies somewhere in between. And let me show you why this is important. So um, on, on, in this screenshot, we have um, a hopefully well-known blue as a foreground color and a background color of white. 
And seeing that in action in just as text on the background or in a form, uh, in an input element, um, this is contrast ratio of, uh, of 16.54 to one. Um, I will give you some more details about those numbers in a minute. Um, but most, of, yeah, first of all, let's look at this uh, example number two, this bad color contrast ratios. Um, there is a green as a foreground color and a blue as a background color. And while these colors look like they are distinguishable, they are not. So if you use the green as a foreground color and the blue as a background color, this actually only has a, a um, contrast ratio of 1.12 to 1. And you can see that on the screen, but yeah, if you try to read uh, what is written there here in the upper example, text below is actually the same. That is pretty hard. And um, again, with regards to accessibility, um, there are very easy to understand requirements. Um, the one is that any uh, two non-text content or interactable elements need to have a contrast ratio of three to one. So for example, the button color compared to the background color of the page. And um, any text element um, needs to have a color contrast ratio of 4.5 to one or higher, of course, uh, the higher, the better. Um, and to give you another example of that, our default primary color in our design system um, has a color contrast ratio of 4.68 to one compared to white as a background. Or if you switch it around, if you use white as a, as a text color uh, here in the button, in the filled button, um, then the background has the same um, contrast ratio, of course. And that is, yeah, good readable. So <laughs> that's actually what I want to show you on the next slide. Um, any, anyone is affected by bad color contrast ratios um, in, in an accessibility uh, way of, of looking at things um, when you have trouble seeing certain colors, but also with any glare on your display. So for example, if you're traveling and have your laptop on, uh, on your lap, um, the sun shines on the laptop and you might just, yeah, have not such a perfect view on your display. And um, yeah, having a bad color contrast ratio um, is actually yeah, a, a worse work environment in such a case. And even if you have a, a nice steady office environment without any changing light, um, it might be just the case that is hurting your eyes less to have good color contrast ratios. Uh, unfortunately, it is super hard, or it was super hard for us to get there. The deaf experience was horrible. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we had to um, pick colors manually and then we built because that was not, not effectively um, uh, getting us to, to any goal. Um, we built tooling into our design system to uh, um, at least check the existing color contrast ratios against these uh, um, accessibility guidelines or requirements. And then if they were not fulfilling um, the minimum contrast ratios, recommending colors that would. And that is still a very um, yeah, lengthy process of reviewing uh, colors with yeah, much attention to detail. I think, um, yeah, if you can give that to some designer. <laughs> Uh, who will probably know that better um, for development. This is yeah, not such an easy task, but as an outcome, if, if you want to use the own cloud design system, which I mentioned throughout this talk sometimes, um, and which you can use very easily if you want to build on cloud web extensions, um, then we have solved a lot of these issues already. Um, and, I, and I hope um, that you can have a look at it and uh, try it out. Um, there's a workshop today about um, building an on-cloud web extension. Yeah, there's the chance to use design system components in there. And that is um, yeah, actually in, in regards to accessibility and a pretty nice state. And I'm yeah, very proud that, that we managed to solve a lot of usability issues on this way um, for better accessibility.
that's it. Thanks, you. Thanks for your attention. We have a QA room afterwards because I think the time is nearly up. Um, and I would like to talk to you in person if you have any questions.